with that, we're going to have our next presentation, which will be air quality regulations and how this research study relates to the air quality reporting. Our presenter will be Rick Stolwell. He's an associate professor and extension ag engineer at the University of, Min of Nebraska. Excuse me, I'm going to get in trouble here. And so, Rick, I will turn it over to you. Hopefully, I push the right button. Uh, I'm Rick Stoll at the University of Nebraska, also with the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center. And uh, I think the reason that I'm giving the talk on regulations is we wanted someone who was, or we thought it would be better to have someone who was not collecting the data and uh, directly responsible for the data collection to do some of the interpretations from the uh, regulatory standpoint. Okay, uh, real quickly, uh, the next screen is going to talk about broad categories of regulations, so they're state, federal, and local regulations. And within each one of those, there's some variability in terms of regulations. Uh, I'm going to focus most of my presentation on EPCRA, which is a, a reporting requirement. And, um, and But there are other regulations out there. I talk about each one in the paper or in the proceedings. And uh, I'm going to just touch on each one here today, but I'm going to focus on EPCRA. So when we think about EPCRA, really there are two reporting requirements that are out there that EPA uh, oversees. The first one is the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, or CERCLA. And uh, it is very similar to uh, EPCRA, the Emergency Planning and Right to Know Act, in terms of what they impact, um, what they relate to, and then um, what the response has to be, which is basically a reporting. Uh, in both cases, the EPA oversees these, but in neither case does the report directly go to EPA. So a little bit of background. I think it's important to understand uh, where these rules come from or came from and how they're going to be seen within EPA or, uh, or what's the motivation for why there might be a compliance uh, requirement or some kind of action. So if we look back uh, briefly at CERCLA, uh, is enacted in 1980, and this was basically a response to some spills, primarily offshore or uh, maritime spills. But the bottom line is that EPA uh, and Congress basically thought that uh, if there was a spill or an emergency uh, release of a chemical, um, there should at least be a reporting of that, that incident. And so, for example, an agricultural uh, application, there's one, a specific one uh, cited there, but if you, there's a lot of ammonia, anhydrous ammonia tanks around. If a farmer had an anhydrous ammonia tank on their, uh, their farm and there was a leak, a rapid leak, and uh, part or most of the tank, uh, the ammonia was released, uh, that would be something that has traditionally been and continues to be uh, a possible source of requirement to report under that. It's that emergency type uh, scenario. Well, CERCLA, actually, uh, that would be required. So EPTRA is a little different. Um, this goes back <coughs> excuse me, to uh, 1986. EPTRA is part of the Superfund um, process that uh, went on in the 80s and continues today. Um, basically, this came about because of chemical dumps. And so the communities and, and residents, individual citizens, uh, were very upset that they found out they had purchased land that was used to uh, contain chemicals, or there was a release of chemicals and they didn't find out for two months or two years uh, that that release had, had happened. And so the reporting in this case uh, goes to the local authorities uh, and also to the state, uh, not directly to EPA. So that's the background. It's emergency type situations, uh, spill situations, and so for background with agriculture, specifically animal agriculture, uh, the intent has never really been uh, anything for animal agriculture. Uh, at least not routine activities, especially uh, raising of animals, normal activities associated with raising animals. But in uh, so in the 1980s and 1990s, we didn't hear much about these regulations, even though they were in place, and they haven't changed. The actual regulations haven't changed. It's just the interpretation of the regulations that have, um, have changed since then. <coughs> so the real key moment was uh, 
2003, Sierra Club sued Tyson Farms, saying that their uh, poultry operations in Kentucky, the first lawsuits came up, were emitting ammonia, and since they were emitting all this ammonia in the air, um, that qualified for a reporting requirement. And they took that lawsuit <coughs> uh, and, and got a lot of attention out of that, a lot of publicity out of that. And basically, uh, one of the things that came out of that was the EPA was getting a lot of pressure to enforce this. And so they said, we don't know, I have enough information. Uh, let's get a study going. And they came up with the EPA Air Consent Agreement back at that time, which basically funded the National Air Emissions Monitoring Study, or the NAMES. Uh, one thing, as beef producers, many of you will be aware that the uh, cattle industry, beef industry, did not participate, uh, selected not to participate in the name study. And so, even though the name study has been completed, that information is um, being considered by EPA now, uh, there is no data in the names that's, that's for cattle producers. So, think about this. In 2007, the EPA came out with this proposal. They proposed to uh, make all animal feeding operations, at least the normal activities associated with raising animals, uh, their proposal was that agriculture be exempt from these reporting requirements. And their justification that they came up with was, we're not going to come up with any response if somebody reports that they have these emissions. We're not going to have any response to them. It, it doesn't warrant response. And it's an unnecessary burden for the people who have to take these reports. Okay? So that was EPA's position. A year later, it was obvious that uh, they had continued to receive pressure and they had made some negotiations and com a compromise because uh, they got their way at the federal level that uh, all animal agriculture, op animal feeding operations are exempt from reporting under CERCLA. So no, no federal um, report has to go in under CERCLA, but the, uh, the antis, if you will, uh, were thrown a bone, and basically large CAFOs were left as needing to report if, uh, if they exceeded the thresholds associated with EPCA. So, good news, most, in terms of numbers, most producers, their operations are going to be exempt from this report. The bad news is that large CAFOs are still subject to this. Okay, <clears throat> a few details about EPCA. Uh, the first question is, are you of the size that, that would require you to consider reporting? And so the basic question is, are you a CAFO by the NPDES um, definition? So if all you are doing is raising cattle, uh, if you have 100 or 1,000 animal units, 1,000 head of beef cattle, uh, you would uh, be at the threshold for being a large CAFO. If you're under that size, you are exempt, no matter if you exceed the threshold or not. Second question is, if I am a large CAFO, um, I have to come up with an estimate of what my daily, uh, peak, uh, daily emission might be, and if that number, uh, specifically talking about ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, which are listed hazardous substances with EPA, if that amount exceeds 100 pounds per day, <coughs> Uh, then I'm supposed to file a report via uh, EPCA. So, not much data out there on, on emissions. Uh, you've seen it filtering in uh, the last few years, uh, last decade, some starts to come in. Uh, so one of the questions out there is, how, if I'm a producer, how do I decide if I'm, I need to report it? Okay. EPA's response is, well, we know that there's not data out there but uh, you need to make a good faith estimate. And if there is information out there that um, uh, from a land grant university or somebody else that's credible, uh, you need to make a, an estimate and uh, determine whether you need to report or not. Not the most desirable, um, clean, clear uh, guidance to do this. So let's look at the data that came from the study. If we, uh, if we put it, 
the units in the uh, US system in pounds and uh, multiply by a thousand. And two reasons I'm multiplying by a thousand here. One is uh, I work better with numbers that are greater than one instead of decimals. Um, and uh, oh, probably some of you do too. Uh, and you can see a lot of numbers, even for a thousand head of cattle, we have some numbers that are much, much less than one. Uh, but the one, the one number that stands out is, well, the other reason for a thousand head is this is the threshold for uh, being a large capo. So if you're not a large capo, the amount of emissions, at least for EPCRA, doesn't matter. If you're, if you are monitored and, and uh, we're putting out uh, 1,200 or uh, 120 pounds per day, but you're only 900 head by by uh, uh, EPA standards, you would still be exempt because of the animal limit. But what you do see here is there's, as was highlighted, there is a range of emissions throughout the year. Uh, higher, slightly higher range, and more variability for the pack barns. Uh, but what you do see in both cases, there are days in warm weather when the curtains are open where the number is greater than 100 pounds per day. So, some of the conclusions that can be made on that is uh, ammonia emissions from both barn types uh, in this study were found to, on certain days during warm weather, exceed the 100 pounds per day threshold. So, does that mean you have to report? Uh, there's still questions out there. Uh, do the barns that were studied in this, this, in this study, are they representative of all the barns that would be out there? We can't answer that question. There are only two barns of each type. That's not enough to do a statistical uh, evaluation. But if it, someone was to decide they want to report, they could use these numbers uh, to do so. The other question is, uh, what is the reportability of the data? Is, is EPA going to accept the methodology and the numbers that were collected in this re report? Or the bigger question is, since they don't even want to be dealing with this reporting, um, what type of information would be acceptable? They're not giving us a lot of guidance. Can we get, a, get away with using averages? Do we have to use the maximum daily amount that we measured? And is that maximum daily amount that I measure on one farm going to correspond to the maximum daily amount on another farm? Those are all some big issues. Um, probably the only thing we learned here is that uh, the number can exceed 100 pounds per day on both farm types. All right, just a little bit on whether it's report or not. Um, basically, if you do, if an operation decides to report, it is compliant with the law, which as a university employee, um, that's something um, in our advice, we have, to, we have to hold that pretty high. Uh, on downside, it is an acknowledgement to the public that, uh, that hazardous compounds are being released from an operation. And so there is, there's a PR, piece to this that every operation will have to consider. Uh, I would not expect any kind of response after that initial uh, report. I wouldn't expect any kind of response from your state or EPA um, based on this. The way I look at this is, is the EPCRA, the filing for EPCRA is kind of like getting, if you're going to go to Africa, uh, you have to decide whether you're going to get shots or not for some of the diseases. If you decide to, to get the shots, it's a pain in the rear, right? Uh, pun intended. <coughs> Filing an after report is going to be a pain in the rear. Uh, you got to do some things like call your, you have to actually physically call on the phone. Uh, if you don't get your shots when you go to Africa, most people who go to Africa and don't get shots will come back and they're not going to have disease, right? If you don't file for Africa, odds are EPA is, is and the state are not out there looking for you. But unfortunately, some environmental groups are using this as a leverage piece. They know that, um, that this is a chink in the armor of, of some operations. And so there is a risk of it. And, and you have to evaluate your risk as an individual operation. Or um, if you're consulting with someone, uh, you have to evaluate that risk. Just like I evaluate my risk going to one country in Africa versus another country in Africa. 
All right, a little bit about uh, that, uh, talk about the Clean Air Act and some other policies that uh, EPTRA is, is exactly that. It's a, it's a pain in the rear, but once it's done, it's done. There's no follow-up reporting unless you change something major in the operation. Uh, there's no annual visits. There's, there's no other requirements. Um, some of the other regulations that are out there have a lot more meat to them if they apply to an operation. So for example, the Clean Air Act uh, basically is out there, establishes public health-based standards, uh, these national ambient air quality standards, and basically looking at six criteria pollutants. Of those six criteria pollutants, particulate matter is the only one that uh, specifically is found uh, as a major emission from uh, livestock operations. So that's one of the main reasons why particulate matter is kind of in the news. Ammonia and hydrogen sulfide, neither one of those are criteria pollutants. So it's important to recognize that. There's a lot of concern out there with ammonia because we know there's ammonia coming out of our livestock facilities. And we also know that ammonia can react with other compounds in the atmosphere that are coming from urban uh, industrial sources to form fine particulates. So one of the main concerns out there right now is that ammonia will be, the environmental groups will, will try to regulate ammonia on livestock farms because it can turn into PM2.5. Alright, let me talk about uh, the Clean Air Act. There's two main things you want to think about. Uh, well, two results. Enforcement can involve getting, having to get an air permit. Some of you have to get uh, uh, state or federal permits for water quality and nutrient management plants. Uh, air permit is as big or bigger a deal. And so we, most farmers would like to avoid this. If you've hear, heard about the problems that people in California have had trying to get a digester put in because they can't get their, they have to get an air permit to make their un, engine uh, meet the rent limits. That comes back later. And so there's air permits required and EPA may actually um, require you to control, not just report your emissions, but control your emissions. All right, the emphasis is primarily on non-attainment areas and on our, you know, what they call major sources. So this did not come out nearly as well as I like. It is not clear in your proceedings either. So maybe uh, EPA, this is straight off the EPA's website, and when you print it off, it comes out really nice. Um, but apparently they've got some magic code that doesn't allow it to reproduce. Uh, it shows up on the screen here, but not here. Bottom line is, I'll uh, just kind of like one of the cellular phone commercials, you've got to guess what this is, this is the United States. And you're looking for yellow marks, and the only yellow marks in the four state area, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, 10, would be right around the Quad Cities, I guess it would be right about there. And uh, you'll see a lot of yellow over here, this is California. Okay. So uh, you can guess where California is based on the yellow on that map. The good news is uh, this area uh, of the country is almost exclusively in, a, uh, in, in attainment. There are very few areas that are not attainment. Uh, if we look at uh, impacts with this study, bedded beef farms do not have high emissions of particulate matter. So we're looking at annual emissions, so we're not betting these operations continuously. Um, normally they have very low uh, airflow or uh, particulate matter emissions, so not likely to become sources, major sources under uh, Clean Air Act. What I want to point out is if ammonia would ever become regulated under the Clean Air Act uh, as a primary pollutant, uh, criteria pollutant, uh, it could it could reasonably show up as at about 10,000 head. Uh, you could get up in this 100 tons per year range and have what would be called a, a major source uh, for clean air. So it's important to keep track of uh, policy issues. If you hear somebody talking about regulation of ammonia, get engaged because this is one that the industry can't really afford to, to sit by and 
let the environmental uh, just push it through. Okay, uh, mandatory greenhouse gas rule. Uh, just briefly, uh, a few years back, there's a rule put in place that facilities emitting 25,000 metric tons or more of greenhouse gases uh, had to submit a, uh, an annual report to EPA. Uh, methane and nitrous oxide are greenhouse gases uh, emitted by ag animal agriculture. Uh, they were both monitored in the study, although the reports weren't highlighted uh, uh, very much in, in uh, these results. Uh, one of the things is if you look into the rule that came out, manure management specifically, uh, most people know that uh, beef cattle emit methane uh, through rumination. That would not be considered in, by the EPA. That's excluded. But any emissions that come from uh, manure management are outlined in this. And uh, they use this in calculating what it would take to get to 25,000 metric tons. All right, just if you look at the rule that's out there that's in place and has been adopted, AFOs that are below uh, 29,000, uh, 300 head of, of beef cattle, if that's all you have just raising beef on operation. Uh, so most operations are going to be exempt. You have to have more than that number of uh, uh, cattle to be uh, uh, eligible to, to have to report. So it's, most operations don't have to worry about this. Uh, what has happened uh, very quickly after that, uh, Congress, specifically the, the appropriations committee came and specifically said, we're not going to give you funds uh, to implement the agricultural component. So EPA is out there uh, and they are not uh, doing anything with reports that are coming in. Uh, unfortunately, nothing has happened with the rule. So I know of uh, half a dozen or so operations in Nebraska, for example, that are uh, working with a consultant to fill out reports just because the official rule says they're supposed to, even though Congress is not providing any funds for EPA to enforce that. So it's kind of a, a touch and go situation. So the implications of the study results here is unfortunately, um, um, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, um, the data that's being collected won't specifically be used. EPA specifically outlined how to calculate your emissions. Um, but the equations that EPA uses uh, could be qualified or adjusted based on the data that was collected in the study. Just very quickly, OSHA uh, has a worker health focus. And the bottom line is that none of the concentrations that uh, we were seeing here would be uh, of much consequence for OSHA limits, uh, what they call permissible exposure limits. Those are eight hour limits, time weighted averages. Uh, and so they're always below that threshold um, over the eight hour periods, if you look at the averages. Um, I do want to highlight that uh, during bedding uh, and during pack removal, you're likely to have some, some intervals that uh, you should take some precautions just for the uh, well-being of your, your employees, your workers. All right, very quickly, state and local regulations, uh, Minnesota and Nebraska, both have monitoring policies in place for hydrogen sulfide or coal reduced sulfur. And they have been and, and continue to be out there monitoring um, certain operations. It's basically on a complaint basis. On a local setting, um, three states have zoning, local zoning has authority to uh, set setbacks, and those are largely set based on air quality issues. So implications on a state basis, uh, the study, this study did not measure downwind concentrations. So the state and local policies are generally oriented towards what's happening at a neighbor's residence or a nearby uh, location. Uh, what we can say is that uh, based on the levels, concentrations we saw in the beef, bedded beef barns, uh, it doesn't look like there would be problems outside of the bedded beef barns for the state, state workers. And Real quickly, uh, I know Minnesota has specific, uh, in their regulation, uh, they specifically say when manure is being uh, applied to land, uh, that period is exempt. So even if we did have 
spikes during the removal of the pack. Uh, that should be exempt under state policy. And uh, finally, for local regs, uh, this is very important for people uh, operations of all size, just because uh, community response can be pretty important and adverse in some cases. Uh, the one thing I will note is that uh, while there's no direct implications we can make, um, we did measure dust and we did measure uh, gases that are could be odors. So obviously you need to take that into consideration as you're working with neighbors and with that, uh, I'll just uh, highlight there are resources available at the Learning Center and at your state extension office and see if there's any questions. Okay, what up. questions do you have? Can you expand a little bit on the particulate matter of PM 2.5 and uh, where we find something that's a size my car or my wife's car or uh... oh, particular matter 2.5 just a minute Rick the question was if 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 we could explain a little bit what we mean by particulate 2.5 versus 10 and where you might find that and how it relates to every day okay okay uh, PM 2.5 is a really small particulates they call fine particulates and the implication of that is it, it can get deep down below uh, for example, in animal agriculture, uh, most of the particulate matter that's produced is what we call dust and it's larger size. Uh, so if you think about the soil particles, the skin particles, the feed particles, those are all, most of that dust is going to be, as is shown in the study, is going to be larger than that. Uh, fine particulates would be made through some industrial uh, processes. Uh, some aerosols, if you think about aerosols, and, and especially if aerosols react with each other and, and small molecules form bigger molecules, um, but there's still small, small molecules that will get into your lungs. So that's really where ammonia is, is that key thing to think about because ammonia by itself is not considered particulate matter. But if it reacts with other compounds, then those compounds kind of act like particular matter and they can be uh, problems. I don't know if I can. Let's thank our Rick and uh, we'll set up for our next one.